Hi everyone, welcome to my talk on big data insecurity. <laughs> I will talk about how we can analyze these big data infrastructures from an offensive point of view. Before starting, let me introduce myself briefly. My name is Sheila. I work as head of research at Dream Lab Technologies, a Swiss infosec company. And I'm an offensive security specialist with several years of experience. And in the last time, I had focused on security in cloud environments, cloud native, big data, and related stuff. Okay, so uh, let's go to the important things. There are some key concepts I would like to explain before jumping into the security part. Probably the first thing that comes to mind while talking about big data is the challenge of storing large volume of information and the technology that will take care of it. Although that's correct, around the storage technology, there are many others of great importance that make up the ecosystem. When we design big data architectures, we must think about how the data will be transported from the source to the storage, if the data requires some time of processing to be consumed, and how the information will be accessed, right? So, the different processes that the data go through are divided into four main layers that comprise the big data stack. We have the data ingestion, that is, the transport of the information from the different origins to the storage place, the storage itself, the data processing layer, because the most common is to ingest raw information that later needs some kind of processing. And finally, the data access layer, basically how users will access and consume the information. And let's add one more layer here that is not part of the big data stack, but we have this layer in all big data infrastructures. The cluster management is really important. So for each of these layers, there is a wide variety of technologies that can be implemented because the big data stack is hugely big. <laughs> This one are just a few of the most popular ones. Um, for example, Hadoop for the storage, Spark and Storm for processing, Impala, Presto, Druid for accessing the information, Flume, Scoop for data ingestion, Zookeeper for management, for example. <clears throat> so when we analyze an entire big data infrastructure, we can actually find many different and complex technologies interacted with each other that they meet different functions according to the layer of the stack where they are located, right? So let's see an example of a real big data architecture. Here we have two different clouds, one in AWS and another one in any other cloud provider. Both are running some Kubernetes clusters that are serving different applications and we want to store and analyze the logs of these applications. So we will use FlyingBit to collect uh, all the application logs and write them to Kafka for the first cloud and stream them using Flume and Kinesis to an on-prem Hadoop cluster. So uh, within the Hadoop cluster, the first component that will receive the data is a Spark Instructor Streaming. This one will take care of ingesting and also processing the information before dumping it into the Hadoop file system. So once we have our information here, we want to access it. <laughs> so for that, we could implement, for example, Hive and Presto. Or instead of Presto, we could use Impala, Druid, or any other technology for interactive queries against Hadoop, right? And if we are developing our own software to visualize the information, we will probably have an API talking to the Presto coordinator and a nice front end. <laughs> and finally, we have the management layer. Um, here it's super common to find Apache Zookeeper to centralize the configuration of all these components. <clears throat> and also an administration tool like Gambari or a centralized log system for cluster monitoring. So this is an example of a real big data architecture and how the components interact with each other. So back to security, um, the question is how we can analyze these complex infrastructures. I would like to propose a methodology for this, um, where the analysis of 
is based of, um, on the different layers of the big data stack. Because I think that a good way to analyze uh, big data infrastructures is to dissect them and analyze the security of the components layer by layer. In this way, we can make sure that we are covering all the stages that the information we want to protect go through, right? So from now on, I will explain uh, different attack vectors that I found throughout this research for each of the layers. Okay, so let's start with the management layer. Zookeeper, so as I said, is a widely used um, tool to uh, centralize the configuration of the different technologies that make up the cluster. And its architecture is pretty simple. It runs a service on all nodes, and then a client, let's say a cluster administrator, can connect to one of the nodes and update a configuration. So when that happens, Zookeeper will automatically broadcast the change across all the nodes. <clears throat> so if we scan a node of the cluster, we will find the ports 21, 81, and 38, 88 open because uh, these ports uh, belong to Zookeeper, are open by Zookeeper, basically. So the port 2181 is, is the port that accepts uh, connection from client. Should we be able to connect to it? Well, according to the official documentation of Fembari, a tool that is widely used for deploying on-prem big data clusters, disable the firewall is a requirement for installing big data clusters. <laughs> so we can probably connect to Zookeeper. How should we do it? Um, we can download the Zookeeper client from the official website. Then it's just about running this command, specifying the node the IP address and the 2181 port. So once we connect, if we run the help command, uh, there is a list of actions that we can execute over the C nodes. The C nodes or Zookeeper nodes are the uh, configurations that Zookeeper organizes in a hierarchical structure. So with the ls and get commands, we can browse this hierarchical structure. Um, we can find very interesting information about the configuration of all the components that make up the cluster, like Hadoop, High, HBase, Kafka, whatever, right? And of course, we could use it for further attacks. And um, we can also create new configurations, modify existing ones, delete configurations, and this actually will be a problem for the cluster. Some components might go down because um, Zookeeper, for example, is commonly used to manage the Hadoop high availability. So if we delete everything, the cluster might run into troubles. <laughs> so I won't show a demo of this because it's a pretty simple attack, but it's actually quite impactful. So what about Wambari? Um, this is a pretty popular open source tool to install and manage big data clusters. And it has a, a dashboard from which you can control everything, whose default credentials are admin admin, of course. <laughs> but if they were changed, uh, there is a second drawer absolutely worthy to check. And Barry uses a Postgres database to store the statistics and information about the cluster. Um, in the default installation process, the Ambari wizard asks you to change the credential for this dashboard, but it doesn't ask you to change the default credential for the database. <laughs> so we could simply connect to the Postgres port directly using uh, these default credentials that are uh, user Ambari and password big data and explore this uh, Ambari database. We will find here two tables. Uh, the user authentication and users one. So if we want to get the username and authentication key at once, we need to do this in a shrinkery between those two tables. Um, the authentication key is a salted hash. So the best thing that we can do here is just update the key for, for the admin user, for example. I log into the uh, body source code to find a body salted hash. <laughs> Uh, here we have the hash for the admin password. So now we can run an update query. And once done, we can log into the embodied dashboard with the admin admin credentials. 
Well, I know that this is something pretty stupid, <laughs> but it's absolutely worth to check because a body controls the whole cluster. If you can access this dashboard, you can do whatever you want over, over the cluster. And as the default installation process doesn't ask for these credentials to be changed, then you can most likely compromise them in this way. Cool. So the important thing in the cluster management layer is to analyze uh, the security of the administration and monitoring tools, right? So let's now talk about the storage layer. First, first of all, is um, it's good to understand uh, how Hadoop works. It has a master slave architecture and two main components: the HDF, that means uh, Hadoop Distributed File System, and YARN. So the HDF has two main components, the name node that saves uh, the metadata of the files stored in the cluster and runs in the master node, and the data node uh, that stores the actual data and runs in the slave nodes, right? And on the other hand, YARN consists of two components as well, the resource manager located on the master nodes uh, it controls all the processing resources in the Hadoop cluster and the node manager installed in the slave nodes uh, that take care of tracking uh, processing resources on its slave node, uh, among other tasks. But basically, uh, what we have to know is that the HDF, that is the Hadoop file system, is where the cluster information is stored. And then YARN is a service that manages the resources for the processing shops that are executed over the information store. Basically, it's that. So when it comes to the storage layer, we are interested in the Hadoop file system, right? So uh, let's hear how we could remotely compromise it. Hadoop exposes an IPC port on 8020 that uh, we should find opened in, in Hadoop clusters. So if we can uh, connect to it, uh, we could execute Hadoop commands and access the stored data. However, this is not as, as simple as the Zookeeper example was. <laughs> so managing to do this is a little more complex, right? There are four configuration files that Hadoop needs to perform operations over the Hadoop file system. And if we take a look at these files inside a name node, uh, we can see that they have dozens of configuration parameters. So when I saw that, I wonder if I'm an attacker and I don't have access to these files, how can I compromise the file system in a remote way? So well, part of this research was to find among those dozens of parameters, which ones are 100% required and how we can get them uh, remotely from the information that Hadoop itself discloses by default. So I will explain now how we can manually craft these files one by one. Let's start by the core site XML file. The only information we need uh, to head for this file is the namespace. And this is pretty easy to find. Hadoop exposes by default a dashboard on the name nodes on the port uh, 50,070. It's a pretty high port. And we can access it without authentication. So as you can see here, we can find the namespace name, uh, side behind my target cluster. And that's all we need for this file. Then we need to craft the HDF site file. Um, it's necessary to know the namespace that we already have from the previous file. And we also need the name nodes IDs and the DNS of them. So we could have one, two, or more name nodes, and we need to provide the ID and the DNS for all of them in this file. Where can we have this information? From the same dashboard. <laughs> we have the namespace here, the name node ID, and the DNS, right? So we should need to access this dashboard on each name node. Remember that this is on port uh, 50,070. Another alternative is to enter the data node dashboard uh, on port uh, 50,075. And there we can see all the names nodes uh, at once. So the next file is the mapper side one. Uh, here we need the DNS of the name node that hosts the MapReduce shop history. Um, we can try to access the port uh, 19,888 
uh, on the on the name node. Um, if we can see this dashboard, uh, then that's the name node that we are looking for. Um, we already know it's DNS from the previous dashboard, right? So um, finally, um, we need to craft the yarn site file. Um, Again, we need the name node uh, DNS, in this case, the one that hosts the YARN resource manager. So we can try to access the port 8088. Uh, and if we see this dashboard, uh, then that's the right node. And here we can get its DNS, of course. So uh, all these dashboards are exposed by default and don't require any authentication. But if for some reason we cannot see them, uh, we can try to get this required information through Zookeeper with the attack that I, I showed you earlier, because uh, Zookeeper also has all this information, right? Cool, so once we have the configuration files we need, uh, the next step is to install Hadoop in our local machine and provide it with those files to perform the remote communication. As I didn't want to install Hadoop on my local machine, I built this Docker file. <laughs> Feel free to use it, it's pretty comfortable. Uh, you should need to change uh, the Hadoop version to match the, the version of your target cluster, right? So from now on, this is going to be our Hadoop hacking container running on the attacker machine, right? Good, so let's run and get a shell inside it. And um, we can create a config directory to place the XML files we have crafted before. And you also need to copy this log.property file inside this folder. And another thing I did is was to delete um, the host file to write the result of this name node uh, DNS. You can actually use the IP addresses on the XML files, but for some reason I had better results doing this. Okay, so we are ready to go. Uh, just pass to Hadoop this config directory. And you can execute, for example, an ls command. So voila, <laughs> we can see the entire Hadoop file system from a remote attacker machine. Uh, but before jumping into a demo of this, I would like to mention that most likely we will need to impersonate HDF users. For example, if I try to create a new directory using the root user, I cannot. So we need to impersonate a user that has privileges within the Hadoop file system. That means uh, one of these ones. Fortunately, that's very easy to do. We just need to set this environment variable with the Hadoop username before the command, and that's all. That will allow us to create uh, directories and also will allow us to delete uh, directories and files. So we could wipe out the entire cluster information. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's see a demo of this. Here I had my files, the core site with the namespace. I also have the HDS file. This is a, uh, has more information, the namespace, and also the names nodes. For the names nodes, I need to specify the DNS. I have two name nodes in this case, so I need to specify the DNS for both of them. And then this last property was something that I had to add for this specific cluster. The MapRed site has the DNS for the MapReduce shop history address, the name of that has the this resource. And for the YARN site, I had to specify the DNS as well for the resource manager node. So once we have those files, we are just ready to go and we can execute uh, Hadoop's commands over the uh, remote file system. If we check the, the help for uh, Hadoop, um, for the fs commands, we can find a super common command for any Unix system to remove, uh, copy, delete, move files, whatever. To impersonate, we need to specify this environment variable as we saw before. And here we can create uh, directories or we can modify files or delete also. Uh, any directory, right? Good. <clears throat> Good, so let's uh, now talk about the uh, processing layer and how we can abuse yarn in this case. 
So back to the Hadoop architecture, just to remember, uh, you have the scale of processing shops over the data. Um, so these shops uh, execute code in the data nodes. So our mission here is to try to find a way to remotely submit an application to YAN that executes a code or a command that we want to execute in the clusters node. Basically, achieve our remote code execution through YAN. We can use the Hadoop IPC that we were, we were using in the previous attack. It's just necessary to improve a little bit our YAN site file. We need to add the YAN application class path property. <coughs> Uh, this path uh, used to be the default path in Hadoop installations, so it should not be difficult to obtain this information. In the example here, we can see uh, the default path for installation using the Hortonworks packages. Then uh, this other property is optional. It will specify uh, the application output path in the Hadoop file system. It might be useful for us to easily find the, the output of our remote code execution, but it's not necessary. And something I would like to mention that I didn't say before, um, if you can access these panels uh, that we have seen um, under the slash conf, uh, we can find all the configuration parameters, but you cannot just download and use that file. Uh, we still need to manually craft the files the way we were doing it. However, uh, if something is not working for you, uh, here you might find what's missing. For example, uh, here we have the, the path that we are looking for for the, the property we have to set uh, in this case. Good. Uh, so, okay, so now that we have improved our YARN file and we have sent the application to YARN, the question is what application should we submit? Here, uh, Hortonworks provides a simple one that is enough. Uh, for us to achieve the remote code execution that we want. It had only uh, three uh, Java files uh, because uh, young applications are developed in Java, but there are a lot of Hadoop libraries necessary to include and use, so it might not be so easy to develop a native young application. But we can use this one for our purpose. It takes as parameter uh, the command to be executed on the cluster nodes and the number of instances, which is basically on how many nodes uh, our command will be executed, right? So uh, we will clone this repository in our Hadoop hacking container and proceed to compile this shell application. We need to edit the POEM XML file and change the Hadoop version to match the version of our target. This is really important, otherwise uh, this is not going to work. So once we do that, uh, we can compile the application using Maven. Good, uh, so uh, the next step is to copy the compiled jar into the remote Hadoop file system. We can do it using the copy from local HDF command. And after that, we are ready to go. In this way, we can submit the application to jar, passing as parameter the command that we want to execute and the number of instances. Here an example, I have executed the hostname command over three nodes. Um, and we are going to, uh, to receive an application ID. Um, it's important to take note of it, but it's even more important uh, to get this finished status because that means that our application was executed successfully. And now what? <laughs> Where can we see the application output? Is what we are interested in, it, right? <laughs> Well, we can use this command, passing the uh, application ID we got in the previous step. And the output is going to be something like this. Um, we have executed this uh, command over three nodes. Um, so we have three different outputs for the hostname command. Of course, we can change the hostname command for any other, right? So let's see a demo of this. Here I have improved the, the YARN file to add the, the path I need to add. And I had my simple YARN application from Hortonworks. And I already uh, uploaded it to the Hadoop file system. So remember, you can simply copy from local and just upload the shard to the remote uh, Hadoop target. 
And now with this command, we have to specify the local path of the YAML file and the command that we want to execute and the number of instances, the nodes, and the remote path. So with this command, we are going to get our application ID and the status. <coughs> So uh, now uh, we need to use this application ID. Um, in my case, I need to move the output from one directory to other one, uh, just to allow YARN to find the, the output in the next command. It might be not necessary for you. So uh, with the YARN command, we can just get the output of this application. So we are going to see the output for the three nodes. We have uh, the hostname output for the Hadoop 1, the first node, Hadoop 2, and Hadoop 3. Good. So uh, let me uh, show you one more. I submit one more application before uh, to dump a, a file of the nodes. Uh, in this case, the slash etc slash password file. So here we can see uh, the password file for the three nodes as well. So basically you can change these and uh, execute whatever command you want. So that's pretty easy to use and yeah. <clears throat> and it also should be uh, quite simple to change uh, this YAR application to execute perhaps a more complex command. Uh, just Keep in mind that any changes must be made both in the application master file, as we can see here in the slide, and also in the client file, right? So for example, if we want to get something like a reverse shell on the cluster nodes, it's possible, uh, but keep in mind that this is a job that uh, starts and finish. <laughs> So we might need to use alternatives like uh, backdooring the cron tab with the YAR application, for example. So you can uh, execute this command uh, with the YAR application and then backdoor the cron tab and then you will have your reverse shell uh, on every cluster. Sorry, on every node of the cluster. Good. Uh, I can help you talk about Spark in this section. <laughs> Spark is a super popular and uh, widely implemented technology for processing data as well. It's generally installed on top of Hadoop and developers make uh, data processing application for Spark, for example, in Python using PySpark because it's easier than developing a native application for Yarn. Uh, and also Spark has uh, other advantages over Yarn. So as we can see here, Spark has its own IPC port on 7075, sorry, 7077. <laughs> and we can submit an Spark application to be executed on the cluster through this port. It's uh, easier than we can. Um, here we have an example. This small code will connect to the Spark master to execute the hostname command <coughs> on every cluster node. Uh, we should simply need to specify uh, the remote Spark master IP address, our own IP address to receive the, uh, the output of the command and the command itself. And then we should run this script from our machine. Uh, we don't need anything else. It's uh, quite simple. But I'm not going to talk uh, uh, in depth about this because there is already a talk 100% dedicated to Spark. This was given at DEF CON last year. So I truly recommend watching this talk. Uh, the speaker explains uh, how to achieve remote code execution uh, via Spark IPC. That is the equivalent of what we did with Jan. So keep in mind that the Spark may or may not be present in the cluster, uh, while Jan will always be present in Hadoop installations. So it's good to know how to achieve uh, remote code execution via YARN and also via Spark if we have the possibility to abuse this technology as well. Also, uh, so let's uh, take a look at the ingestion layer now. Um, if you remember from our uh, big data architecture example at the beginning of this talk, uh, we have sources of data and such data is ingested to our cluster using data injection technologies. 
there are several ones. Uh, we have some design for streaming like Flume, Kafka, and Spark Structure Streaming, that is a variant of Spark. And then others like Scoop, uh, that inherit uh, static information, for example, from one data lake to other data lake, of, or for, from one database uh, to a data lake, and so on. So from a security point of view, uh, we need to make sure that these channels, uh, that the information go through from the source to the storage are secure, right? Otherwise, an attacker might interfere those uh, channels and it has some malicious data. And let's see how uh, this could happen. This is how Spark streaming or Spark structure streaming works. Uh, it's a variant of Spark that ingests data and also processes it before dumping everything into the Hadoop file system. So it's like two components in one. So uh, Spark structure streaming or streaming scan works with uh, technologies like Kafka, Flume, and Kinesis to pull or receive the data and also has the possibility to just inject data from a TCP socket. And that could be pretty dangerous. <laughs> Here we have an example of how the code looks like when the streaming input is just a TCP socket. It basically binds a port on the machine. So a view of this is super easy. Uh, we can use Netcat or our favorite tool and just send data over the socket. And it works. <laughs> What happens to the data uh, that we inject will depend on the application that processes it. Uh, most likely, we will crash the application because we might be injecting bytes that the application doesn't know how to handle, or our bytes might end up inside the Hadoop file system. That's also likely. <laughs> so it's important to check that the interfaces that are waiting for data to be ingested cannot be reached by an attacker. Right? And regarding Hadoop, uh, as I said, it's move static data. It's commonly used to inject information from different SQL databases into Hadoop. And analyzing a scoop server, I found an API exposed by default on port 12,000. <coughs> we can get the scoop server version, for example, uh, using this query, but uh, there is not so much documentation about the API and Honestly, it's quite easier to uh, abuse this using the scoop client. <laughs> um, so something important is to download the same client version of the server. Uh, for example, this server is 1.99.7 and we should download uh, that version of the client from this website. Good, so uh, what can we do? Uh, well, uh, we could, for example, inject malicious data from a database that belongs to the attacker into the target Hadoop file system. That takes some steps. We have to connect to the remote scoop server, create some links. This is uh, provide the scoop with the information to connect to the malicious database and the target Hadoop file system. And then we have to create a scoop shop uh, specifying that we want to ingest and data from this database link to this other HDF link and store it. <coughs> so this is quite easier to understand with a demo. So let's see a uh, video demo of this. So here I have my, my scoop client and I connect it to the remote scoop server. These are the connectors we have available. We need to create a link for the MySQL um, database, the remote uh, attacker database. So I will specify the MySQL driver and the remote address of the database, some credentials to access to it. And then most of the parameters are optional. So I will choose create it. And also we need to create a link for the HDF uh, target. So here we have to specify two parameters. The first one is the remote IP address of the Hadoop IPC. In this case, it's in the port uh, 9000, but it's going to be most likely in 8020, as we saw before. And the conf directory is a remote path, not a local one, it's a remote path that by default is going to be uh, the Hadoop uh, installation path by default. So now uh, here I'm specifying the, uh, the path of a desktop machine, but 
is going to be most likely like slash etc slash hadoop slash conf so good so now we find no, now we have the um, the links we have to create a shop and in the shop we are going to specify that we want to inherit data from the attacker mysql database to the target uh, hdf <coughs> So we need to specify the name of the table we are going to ingest. And then most of the parameters are optional, so I'll, I leave it blank. Um, <clears throat> so once we create the shop, ah, also here we have to specify the output directory. And that's what's important, that's the remote uh, the directory in the Hadoop file system. So, right, now we have our shop in Health malicious data shop, we just need to store it. And this is all we are going to see in the attacker machine. But to show you that we actually inject the malicious data, I will log in into the remote machine that has the Hadoop file system, just to sh show that the data was actually injected in the file system. Here we have the hacking Hadoop. <laughs> And the hello, blah, blah, this is just data that was in my uh, remote MySQL. And I injected it into the scoop, into the uh, Hadoop file system via scoop. Um, so uh, keep in mind that you can inject malicious data, but you can also um, export data because scoop allows you to import and export. So you can do this in a reverse way and choose uh, steal data from the Hadoop file system into your remote MySQL database, for example. Good, so finally, let's talk a little bit about the data access layer. Uh, back to our architecture example, uh, we saw that it's possible to use different technologies for data access. In this example, we are using Presto together with Hive, but there are many others. And when it comes to Hive and HBase, these are uh, HDF-based storage technologies, but um, they also provide interfaces to access the information. For example, Presto needs the Hive Metastore to query the information stored in the Hadoop file system. So uh, these technologies expose dashboard and interfaces that can be abused uh, by an attacker if they are not rightly protected. Um, for example, Hive exposes a dashboard on port 10002, where we can get interesting information and also an idea of how the data is structured in, in the storage. The same for HBase. And regarding Presto, I found this curious login form <laughs> where password is not allowed. It's, it's quite curious uh, because it's a login form, but you cannot enter a password. <laughs> Uh, I know that you can set up one, by, by, but, but by default, uh, uh, it seems to be this way. Uh, so you can write admin user there and enter. And there is a dashboard that shows some information about uh, the interactive queries being executed against the cluster. Good. Uh, so as I said, uh, this technology is supposed several interfaces. It's common to find at least a shade DVC one. For example, in Hive, we can find it on port uh, 10,000. And there are different clients that we can use to connect to it, uh, like a Squirrel, for example, or even Hadoop includes Beeline. Uh, and we can connect uh, to the remote Hive server, just specifying the remote address. If no authentication is required, of course, but uh, there is usually nothing by default. And Hive has its own commands. Uh, we need to know them to browse the, the information. Uh, with show databases, we can see the databases in the cluster, select one, and show its tables. And then we have sentences to insert, update, delete, uh, like any other SQL database. Good, so I'm running out of time, so uh, let's uh, provide some recommendations as conclusion. <coughs> Many attacks that we saw throughout this talk uh, were based on exposed interfaces, and there are many dashboards that are exposed by default as well. 
So if they are not being used, uh, we should either remove them or block the access to them using a firewall, for example. If some components need to talk to each other uh, without a firewall in the middle, then we should secure the perimeter at least. Uh, the firewall has to be present. Uh, despite the official documentation asked for disabling it, <laughs> I believe that we can investigate uh, what ports need to be allowed in our infrastructure and design a good firewall policy and rules. And remember also to change all the default credentials and implement any kind of authentication in all the technologies being used. Uh, Hadoop uh, supports authentication for the HDF. Uh, it's actually possible to implement authentication and authorization in most of the technologies that we have seen. But we have to do it, uh, because by default there is nothing implemented. And finally, remember that in uh, big data infrastructure there are many different technologies communicating with each other. So make sure that those communications are happening in a secure way. Good. So uh, in the next weeks, I hope to be able to publish some more resources about uh, the practical implementation of security measures. <laughs> so for today, that's all. Uh, thank you for watching my talk. And here's my contact information in case you have any questions. So please feel free to reach me out. Thank you so much. Bye bye.